I influence five people to do something differently, that afternoon has been successful for me. But I'm gonna just go ahead and invite uh, Jay Schiffman up to share his story. So let's give it up for Jay. Welcome to the Choose Your Struggle podcast. I am your host, Jay Schiffman. Welcome to episode 29 of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Hey everyone, good to see y'all again. The hits just keep on coming, and I mean that in a great way, not the, oh lord, what's going to happen next way. Although, you know, the world around us, it's uh, that too. I'm recording this on Thursday. It's been a busy week, got some great things happening. But uh, last night, my beloved Cincinnati Reds, and, and for those who don't know me as well, when I say beloved, I mean literally a tattoo on my body, beloved Cincinnati Reds. Longtime Reds announcer, Tom Brenneman used a gay slur. I, I'm laughing because it's so absurd to me. This is something that's been known a little bit about Tom for a while, but that he would be caught on mic doing it is just, in 2020, it's absurd. And so it's like, what's coming next? You know what I mean? But when I'm using this, I mean, I mean it in a good way. You know, we've had a couple of amazing episodes in a row, and, and this week continues that. The shout out is from a woman that I really respect, who's, who's inspired me a lot, and a good friend of mine, Jessica Gantis. She is the owner, the founder, the um, head awesome guru, coach, whatever you want to call her, at Create Your Own Finish Line, which is a all-around wellness brand and um, company in Cincinnati, Ohio. She has done some amazing work with me. She's done some amazing work for my wife. Uh, a lot of great people I know go to Jessica. So you can learn a lot from her in her shout out. Quick note, she was outside when we recorded this, which if you know Jessica is not surprising at all. And, and the sound quality is fine. I just say that so that, you know, if you hear the birds chirping, she does not own birds. <laughs> she is not just surrounded by them all the time like Snow White. Although. Uh, she is very much that person where she, you know, could walk outside and all of a sudden a deer is just going to come up and nestle her. So she's, <laughs> that is who Jessica is. The interview today is a person, I, I, <laughs> I kind of gush over this person on the interview because, uh, and I say this in the interview, that in terms of helping me as an individual, as a, as a man take the next step in, in my, my personal evolution, there are two women that I really point to and I give credit to for helping me learn and grow. And that is my incredible wife, Lauren, and the interview today. And that is Priya. Uh, one name, she's that incredible, Priya. She is a diversity, inclusion, equity consultant in, in Cincinnati and, and all over, but, but I met her in Cincinnati. She led a, a class that I was a part of a couple years ago and just. I admit this openly, I was one of those people that thought because I grew up in a household that is very liberal, uh, with two very progressive parents, and I thought all of that made me sort of more, uh, I don't want to say woke, <laughs> that's, that's become a joke word almost, but more understanding, more, more open, more, more progressive of a person, and Priya, through her, her work, helped me realize that the I don't see color attitude that I was walking around with is not a, a positive, that that's where I was, and I thought that that was a good thing, and, and through working with Priya, I realized that wasn't the case, and I believe I have grown as a human being more in the last couple of years. It's like this work with Priya unlocked the ability to take the next step in my life. So I, I cannot thank her enough, and, and obviously my wife as well. The interview with her, she's wonderful. I, I definitely cannot say enough. Reach out to her if you want to go through this work. She's just unbelievable. Enjoy that. Thank you for everyone who continues to reach out. I've seen a huge uptick. Uh, and people reaching out and people leaving me awesome ratings uh, recently, those have exploded. So thank you so much to everybody who continues to do that. 
please check out the Patreon. It's in the show notes. Continue to rate. I really appreciate that. Also, if you could leave some reviews, that would mean a lot. My my ratings, as I said, have exploded, but my reviews have pretty much stayed stagnant. So it really means a lot to me to see those reviews. So if you wouldn't mind jumping on Apple. But not only that, there is now a link in the show notes that makes it easier than ever to leave a review. So check that out and, and keep keep engaging. I really love it. I love hearing from all of you. The response to Frank King was wonderful. So thank you so much for that. All right. Without further ado, enjoy the episode. Very quick story. I'll probably end up leaving this in for the podcast. I ran a half marathon about five years ago, and I couldn't walk after the, the half marathon. And this little angel in my life not only made it so that I was able to walk again, but made it so that that would never happen to me again. And that person is Jessica again. Oh, awesome. You are a treasure. So part of what I'm bringing up, I made a Facebook post that said, please leave your phone away from you if you're going to the bathroom. And that was <laughs> where you reached out. Each day I set intentions for my day and I try to schedule those times in the morning for me to actually get to sit and figure out what it is I want to do for myself that day internally, externally, for clients, for work. But one of those practices is the phone. I don't bring it into my room at night. I don't set an alarm clock and I definitely don't bring it in when I'm going to the bathroom because I think it's important to check in with what's going on inside yourself more than it is to check in externally when you're doing something that's private, something that takes attention, something that can show you if you're having trouble in your body. Um, and this goes on and on and on throughout my day, through my practice. I do neuromuscular work on bodies and so I get to see a lot of trigger areas a lot of compensation patterns and then kind of keen in people to the source of that is hard if they have a big question mark on it so I need them to be mindful and be able to meet me where I am in that session and me meet them where they are why do you think so many people are so quick to separate the mental and the physical health aspect of, of our health I think it has to do with societal pressure and wanting to produce instead of taking time to have outcomes come as they might be there's usually deadlines or some type of pressure that allows somebody to start internalizing and making a little bit more productivity than letting themselves be and come out the way that they would it's tricky when you have the ability, for, for those listening and her, her introduces a personal trainer, a physical trainer, you may think, oh, in a big gym, but no, 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 that's not how you do this. You are very hands-on and one-on-one -on -one with your clients, almost in the sense of like the barbershop where people come to you and you, you talk to them while you're doing these things. So you kind right. of have a, a, a much more broader impact on people's lives than just working on a physical aspect of their body. Yeah. And that's, it's been cool because I'll get texts a couple of years later, like, Oh, I remember when you said this thing and that really drove my activity further and that kind of stuff. I've always wanted to make an impact. So when I get that reinforcement, it feeds me more to be able to have space to do it more often. And like you said, I'm very one-on-one. -on -one. I take a lot of personal time and a lot of reflection time so that I actually have space to bring people in because when people come in, sometimes they're in an emergency status and I don't want to meet them in an emergency and funnel around like a tornado. I want to separate and have them bounce ideas off me and get them grounded so when they leave, they're empowered and not hooked to me. Yeah, you and I, I was referred to you by a, a chiropractor because I have I had very, very bad back problems. You helped me a lot. And then we became friends and our, cause our brands overlap a lot. Totally. I have, I have choose your struggle and you have create your own finish line, which are very similar. Yes. I came up with it because it feels like I cannot voice for people what it is they actually want. And sometimes they don't know what they want. So along the way, we're just figuring out what it is that strength and power and empowerment means to them. It doesn't have to be uh, running 65 miles a week or biking 100 miles or doing pull-ups. It could be, hey, I just stood up to this person. 
and honestly, if you're more grounded in your feet, you have a better chance of being a bit more embodied and advocating for yourself. So I just, it feels like I've become an advocate for people and they get to create whatever it is that they're coming in for whenever they're ending. I don't have programs that oppress them into, um, like you have to see me for a year straight or anything like that because it's guided by the person, which allows for people to come and go very often, but <laughs> it's still kind of fun that way. Well, that gives a good transition into shouting out where people can find you both online. And, you know, if they're in Cincinnati and they want to come, they come uh, have you work with them, shout out where people can follow you, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I have a website, createyourownfinishline.com. I have Create Your Own Finish Line on Facebook. And then I have underscore C-Y-O-F-L on Instagram. Woo -woo! I am Priya. And by the way, I do go only by Priya. I choose not to use all the other names that come with me. And I am the president and CEO of my consulting firm called Consultant on the Go. Simplistically, what I do is what I believe, as I like to put it. And I focus in the areas of inclusion, equity, and change management. You somehow are both a breath of fresh air and someone who will smack you around the head with the, the needed information. Honestly, like, uh, you know, I've never met anyone that has that perfect sort of uh, yin and yang before that they can be both the, the person who will tell you what you need to hear, but also do it with a hug. Like you are able to do both of those things. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I, I was actually remembering this morning that like the first real in-depth conversation you and I had was not a good one. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, it could have gone a very different direction if you were a different kind of person because I didn't handle it well. It was nothing about you. It was, and, and I'll very quickly for the listeners, I was in a, a class called Cultural Competency. It was partly led by you, which was an incredible privilege because I look at myself as someone who is culturally competent. And this class showed me that all of us have room to grow. And, and that's where this conversation started. We took an assessment that was not kind to me. And it, it, it led me like to question a lot of things as a person, like I said, who believes myself to be culturally competent. And I was, I was upset. I was angry. Like I said, I did not handle this well. And you both were able to help me understand it to, to make me feel better. But at the same time, we're not giving me a pass. It wasn't like, Oh, sweetie, don't worry about it. It was like, Hey, let's talk about this. Let's process this together. And if you had been a different person, like who knows where the direction of both our friendship but also my place in that class would have gone. And I so appreciate you sharing that story and feeling that way because that was a tough call because again, we didn't know each other. Right. And being on a call with a complete stranger in essence, taking them through this journey, um, I would like to say, if you were not the person you are, <laughs> I don't know where that call would have gone, right? So it was, it was a tough call. I remember hanging up the phone and going, okay, either that went well or it went really bad. <laughs> well, and it wasn't the kind of thing where I got off it and immediately felt better either. It was, you gave me the tools to sit with what I had learned and to actually do some self-reflection and think about it. And, and again, you did that in a very insightful way, in a very kind way, but not a way that would like let somebody off the hook and would say, oh, don't worry about it because that's not your role at the end of the day. And it's tough. And I'll be honest, I often joke about this and you've heard me say in different contexts, I'm happy to do that, but some days I just want to shake people. <laughs> <laughs> you and I did not get to that point, but yeah. some days I just want to shake some people. <laughs> <laughs> well, that class was very eye-opening. It was uh, one of the most worthwhile things I've done, uh, both from meeting you and the other people involved with it, but also the information that helped me understand that being a, a person who has a very diverse set of uh, voices in, of, uh, in my life of, of people that I consider close friends is not the same thing as being culturally competent and culturally self-aware. And that was sort of a frying pan to the head, like a wake up call. And, and, and I needed that. And that's how really helped me as uh, grow as a person. I'm just thrilled to hear that. And the fact that we're still talking two years later. That, that's very true. And especially, not only are we still talking two years later, but we it's not like we 
you know, lost touch. Like you have been a, a resource that I have come to for opinion since then, uh, both in Cincinnati politics and, and, and things that we were trying to do there. And also just on a broader sense, because you are this wealth of knowledge and you are very good at what you do. Thank you. Thank you. I feel very privileged uh, to be to be chosen to do this work because I often joke, I did not seek this work. This work found me. And, and you know, my my story really is, is I, I, I really I'm always amazed how things happen. But my true story is growing up in India. I'm an immigrant to this country. Growing up in India, the age of, of 10, um, I picked a fight with my paternal grandmother because she said she disciplined me in essence and said to me that I couldn't do something that my cousin could do. And my cousin was a boy, so he could do something that I couldn't do because I was a girl. And, and mind you, in the Indian culture, you respect your elders, you take at surface what they tell you, you don't question it. And Jay, I can't tell you where I got it from, but that innate being in me said, oh, that's bull. <laughs> like, what do you mean he's a boy, he could do this, and I'm a girl, I can't do this. And I remember I was so upset with her, I did not speak to her or see her for a couple of weeks. Even though we used to be there every day, I decided I was not going to engage because I did not think that was equitable to me. And so that has been transformed into who I am today. And so I genuinely feel very privileged that somehow I was chosen to lead this work and lead these conversations and continue to grow myself because I am far from being culturally competent. Well, I think that's something that you you taught very well in this class is that there is no, you know, hang the success banner. There is, it's a constant learning and a constant striving to be better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of it, you know, again, with your platform and what, what you are bringing to light, I think just highlights again, the fact that, you know, we as human beings are not designed to be perfect. And, and, the, and, and what, what is perfect in essence? It's like the social construct that we've created puts people in that box. And then for some reason, that social construct has always taught us, you don't question it. You just, you just do it, right? And if, if you question it, something's wrong with you. My dad has always said, this is one of his quotes, that the six most expensive words in business, that's how we've always done things. Yep. And it's so true, not just in business, obviously, but that's exactly what you're saying, is that to keep doing things just because that's how we do things around here has never worked. It will never work, and it will only lead to failure. It will. And, you know, the, the irony of that is, is we as human beings like to romanticize the past. So when we say stuff like that, we are immediately focusing on all the good stuff and we are acting like everything was perfect. Right. Right. Like the good old days. Right. I'm like, what were the good old days? Like, help me understand that because they were not perfect in any form either. <laughs> Yeah, right. And, and you know, there is a, a psychology behind that where our brains tend to, we remember the most extreme bad, like we all remember I think, the worst moments of our life. But then there's a lot of haziness in the middle about the not so great. And then we remember all the all the good. I asked someone this not long ago, and I would love your opinion on this. Why are we so afraid of being uncomfortable? So I'm sure psychologists will tell you all the reasons behind it, right? From the biology perspective. I'm, I look at it more through the lenses of social construct and just how we as human beings are programmed. I think it's a combination of things. I think one is we are programmed from an early age to fear the unknown, right? It's that, it's that monster in my closet, monster under my bed. We're, we're taught to fear it. If you don't know something, be afraid of it because you can't trust everything. So I think that immediately says if something is out of my comfort zone, ooh, is it going to be good? Because it can't be good. I was always told it was going to be bad, right? So that's one piece of that social or maybe cultural context that comes into play. The other thing I think is, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, our society tells us that if we have reached a certain plateau in our life, we just have to know stuff. Right. So so what happens then is that biology kicks in where that between the biology and the ego, the biology kicks in to say, OK, what I know is good. It's my shortcut. I can go to it. I'm the expert. The ego kicks in because the ego says you've spent the last 20 years mastering this skill. You know it. How could you not? And things haven't changed. It's still the same. And so between the two, when something new comes up, I like to look at it through the lenses of the learning continuum. 
what happens is we all operate with between that ego and the biology piece through the lenses of unconscious competence. So unconscious competence is when you act without effort. You don't think you just do it, right? Like if you have an itch, you just itch. You don't stop and listening and, and then itch. What happens when we are brought new information, we are forced out of our comfort zone and we could be consciously feeling incompetent. Right, so if I'm consciously feeling incompetent, it's like, oh crap, I should know this and I don't. Everybody around me knows that I don't. My ego and my biology are now at conflict, right? Because my ego is saying, Jay just introduced me as an expert. And I just said, I don't know. Oh my God, how am I gonna work through this? Right, so I have to save face. So immediately I wanna leave that uncomfortable space come right back into my comfort. So this is something that I recommend a lot to, to clients. It's something I talk about on this podcast, and that is taking time every day for a daily check-ins to be in touch with what is happening down in your subconscious and what's bubbling up. Because if you don't know what's there, you can't address it, you can't sit with it, you can't understand yourself. And it also leads to boiling over. And I, in my opinion, at least, the more comfortable you are with seeing yourself less as that mystical expert and more as just a human, you're okay with saying the words, God, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I would be happy to get back to you on that, but I, I don't have an answer for you right now. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But in the moment, we've all been there where it's just like you get that immediate reaction of, oh, shit, I, I, don't, I don't know this answer. What do I do so I don't look bad? And you have to be able to say, you know what? It's OK. I'll just I, I can be I can be wrong. I'm, I'm allowed to be wrong. And, and, you know, I think, again, I go back to. So for me, as you have heard me say before, you know, we are all programmed from the moment we are born. Right. There's that collective programming that goes into making us who we are as grown human beings, whether it's our parents or our grandparents or whoever raises us from those first several days that we are alive. Right. All the way through our educators, our media, our environment, our politics. And, and part of what is happening, at least and this is truly just my belief, I think, is because we are programmed, most of us don't recognize, to your point, what is the stuff below the waterline? What is happening in my subconscious? Why do I believe what I do? Because that's one of the things that I'm always fascinated with when I ask people, well, I'm not questioning your belief, but tell me why do you believe this? Right. They don't have an answer. And so what that draws, at least for me as a conclusion, is that I think a lot of us are walking around, you know, asleep. I call it asleep, right? As in like they're on autopilot, Whoever programmed them, they're operating from that construct. They don't question it. They just go with the flow because they don't want to cause a ripple. They may not be happy, but then when you ask them the question about what happiness is, they look at you like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> right? It's, it's like they're just on a programming, the programming that was put in them. And then there are those of us who are constantly seeking, asking questions and coming from that growth mindset and saying, Yes, we all, we have the programming. You have the programming your parents put in, I have mine, but I'm still questioning and pivoting in a lot of different ways, which is difficult, right, Jay? Because let's be honest, I'll speak for myself. My mother does not approve with the 90% of the things I do. <laughs> it's, that's very true. Not about your mother, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not question. It's very difficult. Do you think that like you you touched on earlier the, the you live the immigrant experience and that's that that fear of the unknown has to be huge and i feel like as an immigrant you either tackle it or you can get eaten alive by it cuz you you came over to a place where everything was new was that something that you had to sort of just embrace or was that a long term coming to terms with with that experience you know, I love that question. I know that wasn't a plant, but I love that question. And here's why, because this is where for me, this all ties back, not just to our programming, but also our innate personalities, right? Like how are we innately put together? We can make it as philosophical as we may choose to. For me personally, I came here when I was 20. Okay. So I had no college education. I had half my bachelor's in India, but so no real college education in this country, no marketable skills and 20 years old, right? What do I know? 
And to your point, honestly, I just came in with curiosity because my personality is just being curious naturally, right? So I came in just curious, experiencing what was around me. I did not come in with my set of expectations or beliefs, right? I mean, my values were there, like who I am as an individual, what my culture was, but I didn't come in and saying, oh, I'm going to show up and people are going to react a certain way. So I just came in and immersed myself. And I think that is one reason, at least I feel like my experience was a little different because I came in with a curious mindset and I went with the flow. I learned where I needed to, I flexed where I could. And then I made decisions along the way where I was going to flex and not going to flex. To your point, that's that to me, this conversation ties also to that innateness in us. We could have someone who was born and raised in this country but they are holding on to things so tight with their set of expectations and behaviors that they choose not to pivot because they're just not curious. I don't wanna sound morbid, but my worldview is, I don't have a guarantee that I'm going to see 67, 68, right? So, so it's about how can you balance your life today, balance it where you, you're comfortable today, you're enjoying things today, and you're planning for the future, but you're not, putting everything off for that future. I love that. That's exactly right. And, and, and you know, I, I, I don't think it's more of it, you know, as a person in, in recovery, you know, I saw the, that reality. And so I said very early on after I got in recovery, I'm not comfortable with working for the weekend and saving for retirement because two, two days ago was, could have been it for me. You know what I mean? So like I, I, fully co-sign that that statement and and I love that idea this this work the nine to five job and so you you get the handshake and the watch is just we we can't you know if those are the good old, day, old days I don't want to go back to the good old days I refuse to go back to the good old <laughs> days right and 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 let's be honest Jay you know even though those might have been the good old days those are not the days of today so even if you want to go back to it you and I both know in the corporate world that is very rare today that someone is going to retire from somewhere after 30, 40 years between downsizing, right sizing and all the other (laughs) stuff. I mean, you, you know, you're lucky to, to retain a position for seven or eight years. That's a big deal these days. So, so I think, but that's again, that piece of, I go back to your internal benchmark and your own internal happiness, right? How do you define it? And if, if you want to hold on to that worldview, then as I often sometimes say, I'll bring the data to you. <laughs> but if you want to hold on to that belief, then more power to you. So you have found success by being the person, to go back to this idea of being uncomfortable, of helping businesses do something that they probably would either, either they're welcoming, they're like, yes, please help us. Or they're like, God, we know we need to do this, but we're not excited about this idea. You are you're able to help them do this. One, why this topic? What, what about you? It was like, I, this is what I want to work on. And two, how difficult is it to walk into some of those rooms knowing that this is the last thing in the world that most of those people want to talk about, but they know they have to? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely, I don't know why I choose to do this. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. I know my why, but I question it some days. Um, You know, the why really is because I, again, going back to that mindset of, you know, we are all individuals living our lives, wanting to survive and thrive, right? Taking it to that primitive mindset for a second. However, the social construct and the way our systems are set up, they're not set up to be equitable. Because again, through the lenses of biology and all that fun stuff, we create biases. We create systems that give me more, give you less because the pie is not big enough and the competition and all of that stuff. Again, part of the social construct that comes into play. So, so to me, you know, at, at its very core, it's all about how do we create an environment where we look at things through the lenses of abundance, that there's enough of everything to go around and for everyone to be comfortable at the end of the day, however you define it, And then part of it is, how do we get to that place where, again, everybody can do what they want to do while providing for themselves, their families, their communities, without having that one system or individual hoarding everything? 
what, how do you address the people who, who see that as, you know, they, they say that the loss of privilege feels like oppression, right? That that's such an important concept to understand, but when you're on the, on the receiving side of it, it can be, look, not that they're not wrong, but it can be very difficult to, uh, to, to see that as a bonus or as a plus. You're absolutely right, by the way. And that again ties into that the change management piece of it and the psychology piece of it. I'll, I'll use a totally silly example to answer that question. If you've ever gotten like a notification from a credit card company, like a credit card you had that had say 50 different benefits, and then you get an email that says you're losing two of the benefits, you know, they're revamping the program. You didn't even know you had those two benefits. <laughs> but when you read that email, you're like, oh man, I didn't know I had that. And now I'm gonna lose it. Right. As stupid as that example may seem, as we're talking about privilege through the lenses of race, that's how we are as human beings, right? It's like, I don't know I have it. Mm -hmm. One side I'll tell you, I don't have, know I have privilege, right? But then when I recognize suddenly I have privilege and it's been part of my life the entire time, then I'm going like, well, what do you mean I got to lose it? <laughs> As silly as that sounds, that's the that that's the breakdown between that ego yeah. and and the biology piece. And then, by the way, to me, that whole competency piece of the conscious incompetence, because you're walking around unconsciously competent, saying, "I don't have privilege. I worked for it. Let me show you what I did." Right. And then somebody makes you aware, and you now become consciously incompetent. Or the, the flip side of that, which is that I don't have privilege. Look, I'm losing too. And it's like, yes, but there's still ways that you are winning over. That's been so interesting for me that, that was an ascension to understanding that started with, with the work that we started. Because, and, and this is the, the, the personal example, it, it was realizing that I was part of this, I don't see color issue I now recognize that at the time, this is two and a half, almost three years ago, I didn't recognize that. And to me, that thinking was really problematic. And I had never, not only did I never address it, I didn't even know it was there. There's two people that I cite for, for helping me recognize that. One is you. The other one is my lovely wife, Lauren, who, who you know, helped me understand that it's and not everything is as it seems and why that, you know, being that I don't see color person is not a good thing. Um, and, and it really has had an incredible, profound impact on me. And thank you for that. That genuinely means the world. Because again, I'll be very transparent as you know, right after we all saw George Floyd's murder on our social medias and TV, I spent about a week in what I'm going to call pure depression because I was questioning everything I believe and everything I do, right? The, the, the influence I'm trying to make in the world, in our community, whatever that may look like. And I, I mean, I genuinely questioned why I do what I do and is there even value in what I bring to the table? And so, so just, just please know that, you know, you're sharing that like is, is deep because I, I did not want to come back out from that. I'm like, I just can't do this anymore because am I even adding, am I even creating an impact with the work I'm doing? And so, so that genuinely, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad and, and I, I, I'm sad to hear that I understand it because I think we all went through periods of that after George Floyd must have been even more so someone who works in this business every single day. The people who really change the world are the ones that change the pool around them. And, and that is where I think your work is so important and you are having this incredible impact and I think that that, that paints it in such a cool way. Uh, yes, I and I and I appreciate that. I do, and and again, I think part of to your point, I think we have to start recognizing as individuals. Going back to your point around privilege, that you know, if we come from the mindset of abundance, it doesn't mean that suddenly everything is taken care of, all my problems are taken care of, everything is all good. All it means is I recognize that the world doesn't revolve around me alone, and we're in it collectively. Right. I think that's the narrative sometimes we miss because we look at it as well. It's about me and my family or my bank account. It's not collective. When I walk into rooms, back to your question earlier around privilege, 
you know, I recognize that a lot of times I'm in those rooms for a variety of reasons. And so, and I would, by the way, prior to the last six months, I would question why I was in the room or why I was at a table, right? I'm like, oh, wonder why. Mm-hmm. You know, is it because of the color of my skin? Is it because of the work I do? Is it because it looks good? Like, you know, I would, I would question it. Lately, my approach has been, I really don't care why you're inviting me. Okay. You invited me into your organization into at a table. You want to sit down and talk about this. I'm going to show up with everything I believe, everything in my tool belt. And I'm going to show up. And hopefully out of the 20 people in the room or at a table, if I influence five people to do something differently, that afternoon has been successful for me. Right. And I don't care why you invited me. I don't even want to know because I'm going to come. I'm going to do my thing. And then hopefully there's that ripple effect that they go do something else, those five people, and then they create that change. I think that's expertly said. And before I follow that up, I would love to pause and let my listeners know where they can find you and get in touch. Thank you. So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, You can find me on Twitter. And my my LinkedIn uh, profile is Priya Klosak, uh, P-R-I-Y-A, Klosak. I'm sure Jay will put a link or something in there for you. Um, and then you can also follow me on um, Facebook if you choose to. I kind of keep both pretty similar because this is me all day, every day, as I joke. Uh, there's no separation of business and Priya. Priya is the business, as I joke. And then um, my website is consultantonthegollc.com. So, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I would absolutely love to continue the conversation on any of the social media platforms or even in person. Hey, y'all. I hope you're enjoying this awesome interview with Priya. I know you're learning as much as I did. Just wanted to say real quick, big podcast news. dun dun dun, dun. Next week's interview will feature former Congress member Katie Hill. You have probably read about her in the New York Times. She's been everywhere lately. I reached out and said, I want to have a honest and frank conversation about how the incident impacted your mental health. And she said, I am 100% down. So we had a wonderful conversation and I know you're going to love it. So tune in next week and you get to hear me chat with former Congress member Katie Hill. All right, back to the interview. So you made a really great point right before we paused that, you know, uh, you used to question why you're in the rooms and now you're like, I don't, I don't fucking care. I'm going to do what I do while I'm in here. And to a much lesser extent and to a much higher level of privilege, I did that for a long time, being the son of a very, two very well-known people in Cincinnati and the grandson Mm -hmm. of two very well-known people in Cincinnati. For a long time, I was incredibly incredibly self-conscious about what am I doing at, in some of these rooms? Mm-hmm. Am I here because of who I am? Am I here because of my last name? Uh, am I here because of my grandparent, you know? And then I kind of hit this point where it was like, look, this can only open doors. It can't keep me here. And I have to be the one that keeps me in these rooms. And now I was interviewed by a, a, an organization two weeks ago and they asked me my the secret to my success. And I was like, there's no, there's no secret. I was like, look, as a Cincinnati guy, I got to tie this back to Pete Rose. He's a terrible human being, but Pete Rose was not the best at anything, right? He was slow. He wasn't athletic, but he would outwork the hell out of anybody on that team. I said, that's me. I'm just going to outwork you. Like, I am not the fastest. I'm not the biggest. I'm not the smartest. I am just going to outwork everybody in this room. And that's the the quote unquote secret of my success. But that's the humanistic side of it, right? I mean, it's it's not just saying I show up, I blend in and I do my thing. It's that you're like, no, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show you my value. I'm going to show you my worth. And I'm going to show you who I am. Ties it back so well to your point around vulnerability. Is, is vulnerability is not a weakness. It just makes you more human and relatable. And you know this better than I do. You know, when we talk about mental health and we talk about the things that go with it, right? It's these pressures in some cases that, that are put on us through the lenses of our environment and our culture. 
right? There's something that that sometimes can impact it. Again, like I said, you're the you know more about this than I do, but just the way I look at it, to me, everything is like chemistry, right? It's like that perfect balance of things. And so in our environment, when something is off, yeah, there's either, either it's my body chemistry that creates certain things, right? Whether it's the imbalances I may have, or it's my environment that creates certain imbalances that then drive my body chemistry to go off. It's, it's finding that perfect balance. And the thing is, I don't know if there's anything is perfect. Like I always question the word perfect. You know, when someone says it's perfect, I'm like, no, it's fine now, but I don't know if it's perfect. <laughs> so, you know, I often joke about this. I'm like, who, if you have any faith or believe in a higher power, however you, you connect, if you believe in it, I often joke about, you know, the, if we're created in, in that higher power's liking, right? Like, however we came to be, why were we given this imperfect brain in essence that creates these biases that creates these mindsets of fear and hoarding and this and that and, and is that higher being up there just sitting and laughing at us in a way <laughs> like i gave you free will i put you on this amazing earth i created you know and that's where i often joke it's like it's it, it's it's a joke but for deep down for someone that lives in faith in the fact that we are all connected, whether it's through whatever the worldview might be of energy or universe or God or whatever the terms might be, you know, there's some of that spiritual energy connection because we're energy beings. So I do, I often, I reflect on that. And I've been joking about that with my 11 year old the last couple of weeks with everything going on in the world. Every time I'm like, do you think someone's sitting up there just laughing at us? <laughs> I'm picturing, are you a Hamilton fan? I am. I'm picturing the, the king when he goes, John Adams, and he just sits <laughs> back and, and watches. <laughs> uh, man, that's funny. Yeah, we, we just rewatched it. So on that, what is giving you hope right now? Because you and I are very, we're similar in the things that we hold value to and, and what we would define as progress. It, it's almost two different competing narratives right now because yes, you have this collective conscious, you know, I, I was just reading this Pew report that said we're, for the first time in our history, it's like 76% of white Americans recognize racial issues as a major problem. That's huge. I mean, it, like it shouldn't be, but that's huge. At the other side, you know, the, the news today as we're recording this is that our president is sending more goons into Chicago to arrest innocent protesters. So mm. you have these competing narratives. One, how are those both th those things both true? And two, what is giving you hope at the end of the day? Oh, that's a loaded question, my friend. It is a very loaded Woo! question. And you know, I think that the answer to that question would depend on the time or the day or the moment that, <laughs> that, that you asked me this question. So today, as I'm sitting here with you, I think part of the fact that 70 plus percent, and I just saw that similar stat, I don't know where it was, I don't know what the source was either, but 70 percent of, fo of, of white folks believe that racism is a real thing, you know, that it is embedded in our systems. The thing that I have been reflecting on and what gives me hope is, you know, the folks that are out there now saying I'm reading White Fragility and I'm doing this and I'm reading this and I'm having a book club or talking to someone who's different. I'm hoping that they recognize that just reading a book and talking about it is not going to fix anything. Right. So what my hope and desire is, and, and this is something I've been pushing and actually I'm writing a, a post about that as well, because it's, I'm trying to figure out how to put it politically correct without really pissing off the people that are reading these books <laughs> is, is the fact that you have to do something. So knowing and doing are two different things. Right. So if you know, if you want to acknowledge that racism exists and it's systematic racism, then if you're a leader of an organization or a member of the community with influence, how are you going to use your sphere of influence? Right? Because just because you read the book and you know this is a problem, but you choose not to do about it, now you've made unconscious decision not to do anything. Right? Before you could say, I didn't know. I'll even go with that argument for 30 seconds. You didn't know. <laughs> You didn't believe it. You didn't know. You didn't know about the whole, you know, school to, to jail pipeline. Nothing. This is all new to you. Now you know. What are you going to do about it? 
So what's giving me a little bit of pause as I'm saying this is, I'm hopeful that maybe this was the turning point. Maybe this is the pivotal point we needed in our society that we start doing something about things. And I think it's still too early, right? Because we're only like 90 days in. Um, and then to your point about what's happening in our country is that's where I go back to the impact of culture and leadership on our behaviors. So individuals that are coming from the mindset that we have a president who is our leader, we trust him, we believe him no matter what, because they were taught to trust their superiors, right? Going back to my grandma's story, in my culture, I was taught, you do not question your elders, right? And my sister did have never questioned any of my elders. I questioned all of my elders. <laughs> so I was, I was not the good kid. I was the one that got in trouble. And so that's, I feel, that's how I feel like where we are in this country. We've got the group that is coming from the values that we are trusting whatever our leader does because he knows best. Father knows best. We're going to defer it to him. And the others that are coming from the mindset of, well, that's not true because that's one person and there's a lot of collective wisdom out here. And that one person or that one group doesn't have all the information. Again, the, 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 I, I'll call it the, ba the, the battle between those of us who are walking around consciously saying, we recognize we don't have it all figured out, but something's not right, to the ones that are walking around with their ego saying, we have it all figured out, you guys just need to follow. I was expertly put. I, I love that. And I love, I love the, the funny idea of, of, for a second, humoring this idea that you didn't know any better. And now you do. And that's, that's very funny to me. But on a sense, going back to what I was saying earlier, everybody has a little bit of that. You know, even a guy who two, three years ago, almost when we started this, I would have been saying there was a problem out there with police, whatever. I was still not recognizing my role in this. And now here I am almost three years later, recognizing my role in, in this continued evolution. And so, yes, it is ridiculous to, to, to let anyone say that they didn't know our country had a race problem, but it is not ridiculous to say people are waking up more to their role in, in recognizing what white privilege truly means and, and what this, this, system that our country has been built around has been flawed literally from day one and we never dealt with it no no and in all fairness right just as a data point i don't think this is just a u.s problem right i mean this is where it ties into our conversation about as human beings how we are put together in essence and, and all of that stuff i mean you know India has its caste problems and gender problems and Middle East has its own, you know, so I mean, the, the, the point though is, is till you don't acknowledge that there is a problem, you can't fix it. Yep. And I think we're getting to the place, to your point, that we are starting to acknowledge, but I keep going back to if mom and dad don't acknowledge that what we are doing is not okay. Our leaders, right? Going back to the head of household concept for a second. <laughs> then will the kids ever do what they need to do? Because right now we've got, I don't know, oh, I'm going to say it. We've got a kid, kid that's telling us or leading us through the immaturity <laughs> of life. And, and we are all just following because we believe they know best. And, and I don't know. My worldview says, I don't think they do. I don't think it's too risky to call our president an overgrown child. I think that, that we, are, we are beyond that part where just saying that, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you and I could talk about this for hours. Uh, I am very cognizant of both, both of our time. Uh, and, and, and we have to save some for, for episode two when I bring you back next time. So let's go towards the finishing questions. One more time, tell all my listeners where they can find you and then we'll wrap up from there. Uh, your listeners can find me on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Priya Klosak, my website, consultant on the go, LLC.com. So the last two questions that I always ask everybody, the same two. Number one, uh, you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, what are your self-care habits? Whatever it is, you will not be the first one to say it on this, <laughs> I promise. And number two, who are you following? Who are you reading that we should all be checking out? So the first one, I'm going to show my vulnerability uh, with your question around self-care. Um, you know, I probably would say in the last three months, I have been struggling with actually being consistent in my self-care. 
Uh, because again, we're home. It's a different worldview. I'm used to being on a plane every week and having some downtime when I'm traveling and, you know, life is different. Um, what I, what I have been doing though, for me, nature and water are kind of my, my self-care routines, right? And they've always been part of it. Um, and so we have a little pool in the backyard. So I've been joking, I go and drown myself. And basically <laughs> what that means is I will just go in face forward and I will just stay down as long as I can with my head underwater, right? And I'm literally just floating with my head underwater. And, and it's just so therapeutic. I don't know why. Um, and my 11 year old, when she's in the pool with me, she'll be like, mommy, are you drowning yourself? I'm like, yep, but I'll come back up in a couple seconds, right? Um, and, and, and like I said, nature. So we've been taking a lot of hikes. Um, you know, I love spending time with my 11 year old. She's a mini me as I joke. She's, she's gonna, she's gonna rock the world someday. And, um, you know, so we take a lot of hikes and we just like being in nature. In fact, that last quote that, uh, that, that I put out, I think it was this week, earlier this week came from the walk that she and I went on last week. And so I always have her help me ideate when I'm thinking I'm seeing something and I'm like, what kind of quote would we put here? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, for, for the listeners, she, she posted a picture that's it was a hollowed out tree stump and it said, you can be both hollow inside and grounded. And yeah. I, I love that. And I shared it on my LinkedIn and it got a lot of love there too. It's a, it, it was a great quote. It did, but that's the truth. You know, that's how I'm feeling uh, right now is the, I'm feeling <laughs> grounded, but I'm like, Lord, I need some self-care, right? <laughs> uh, but I'm working on it. And, and for me, honestly, my problem is my self-care typically entails the beach. And obviously getting to the beach right now is a tad bit of a problem. So whole nother story for another day. Um, who am I following and what do I read? You know, for me, um, I I tend to follow a lot of different um, different authors, different folks in the in the in the community, but also nationally. Um, one of the books that I am reading right now, why I am no longer talking about race. It's a it's a great little book, and there's a new book, by the way. I'm going to put in a plug for a colleague and a dear friend. Uh, book coming out here in the next, I think, in the next several weeks, though. It's called Black Fatigue. It's a great book by a colleague of mine, Mary Frances Winters, who has been doing this work for 30 plus years. Um, and it's a great book that really focuses and highlight, you know, what it takes being black in this country and how does that translate into just simple things as even just coming into work or being part of a meeting or code switching. Um, and so, you know, those are kind of the two things right now that, that, that have kind of been keeping, keeping me focused from that perspective and, and just growing. And then not to mention Jay Shipman and his uh, podcast <laughs> and all his work on social media. Y'all know him as the superstar stand-up and blockbuster actor, but did you know that Kevin Hart is also a New York Times bestselling author? And he's back with his second book, The Decision, Overcoming Today's BS for Tomorrow's Success. And you can get it today on Audible. Just for signing up, they're going to give you two free audiobooks and a select free Audible original to get started. So go to the link in my show notes and sign up for Audible today. All right, we've made it to the end of another episode. Thank you all for sticking around. If you made it to this point, you know that the big news is next week's episode will feature an interview with former Congress member Katie Hill. That's pretty exciting, but it just continues this string of amazing episodes. So huge thank you to Priya and Jessica. I really enjoyed their interviews. I'm sure you did as well. Before we get into the final fun stuff for this week, I do want to take a special moment to say thank you I've received some survey results, so thank you so much for that. Keep that up. You will find that link in the show notes. Keep checking out the Patreon. As I always say, keep reaching out. You know how to do that, but if not, the links are in the show notes. All the stuff you need, it's in the show notes. Let's go ahead and do the card for this week, as always brought to you by the Blurt Foundation. We're going to use the 54 ways to ease the anxious mind in honor of Priya. You heard her talking about how she's struggling a little bit with her anxiety. I completely get it. I've been there. And, you know, it comes and goes, and, and it's it's understandable, and, and it's normal. So I thank her for sharing that. 
54 Ways to Ease the Anxious Mind. This week's card is Plan Something to Look Forward to. Plan Something to Look Forward to. That I completely agree with. Let me tell you a very quick story. I am a huge baseball fan. I'll touch on that a little bit more here in a second. But specifically, I was very much looking forward to the game, the for me, PlayStation 4, but you know, you can play it a couple different ways. MLB The Show is one of my favorite games. I've played it every year. I've bought it every year since probably 2012 or so. Last year's version is one of my favorite video games. Up there was Skyrim. I just think that they knocked it out of the park, no pun intended, last year. Unfortunately, this year's was horrible. I mean, they just, they tried to add some new stuff. Look, if you disagree with me, that's cool. Tell me why. It's a very polarizing game. People either love it or they hate it. And I am not alone in saying they will never, unless they come out and say we're going to go back to old methods or whatever, I won't buy this this game series again. When this happened, I bought it. I pre-ordered it like I do every year. I was so disappointed that it really crushed me. It really, it, it, it really upset me. And part of the reason was it was not long after COVID that this came out. And I honestly didn't feel like I had much to look forward to at the moment. I don't mean in life. I mean fun things on the side. So that is a huge piece, always having something fun to look forward to. A little shout out to another hobby of mine. Some of y'all have heard me mention this before, but I uh, collect memorabilia, mostly sports, but a little political and music as well. Uh, and and there's a tradition in the sports world, mostly through baseball, but but in some of the other sports as well, called through the mail autographs, which is where you send a card or something, a baseball, to a, a player who is known to do this, and they'll send it back to you signed. Some of them charge, some of them don't. It's a really fun hobby. If you're interested in learning more, reach out. Be happy to talk about it. And also a quick shout out to a non-sports person, actress Julie Dolan, most famous as the voice of Leia, uh, Leia Organa in the Star Wars universe, on the incredible show uh, Star Wars Rebels. I sent her a card, and she sent me back an entire package of stuff. She also, we emailed for a while. We've talked on Twitter. She is incredible. So shout out to Julie Dolan. I'll, I'll, I'll link something in the show notes for her as well to follow. But there are people who do entire industries around this hobby. And one of them is your good egg for this week. Their name is Autographs for a Cure. I'm a big fan. I've used their services before. Essentially, it's this incredible service where uh, the amazing guy behind it is is in remission from cancer, as I understand it. I may be butchering the story just a little bit. But he raises funds for cancer research by doing TTM through the mail, as we call it, and selling those items for for money that goes to cancer research. I think it's incredible. I love his service. Uh, I can't say enough. Uh, and, and the autographs are cool, too. He gets some people. Obviously, it's a good cause. So more people are willing to do this than the normal through the mail autograph. And and he gets some incredible people. So props to the Autographs for a Cure team, and go check them out. It's in the show notes. Uh, that's your good egg for today. Go check out Autographs for a Cure if you're a memorabilia collector, or if you know someone who is, because his stuff is authentic. There is no questions there. Thank you all for coming along. I will see you next week with the incredible Katie Hill. Until then, show your empathy, spread your love, be vulnerable, and choose your struggle.